So welcome to today's call workshop. Take your research grant writing to the next level, tips and tricks, presented by Dr. Stephen Smith. So I'll begin uh, today's workshop with our territorial acknowledgement. Call CBPA represents member libraries across the region, all of whom sit on the unceded and traditional territories of First Peoples. In Newfoundland and Labrador, our libraries sit on the homelands of the Inuit, Nunatsiavut, the Nunatkavut, the Innu of Natasanon, the Bayotuk, and the Mi'kmaq peoples. In Prince Edward Island and Nova Scotia, we find our friends and colleagues situated on the territory of the Mi'kmaq. In New Brunswick, libraries are found on the land of the Wolastiqui, Mi'kmaq, and Passamaquoddy peoples. We at CALL CBPA which wish to express our sincerest gratitude to the first peoples who share their ancestral homelands with us all. So welcome to all of you who are joining us today. I'll uh, just take a moment to welcome our presenter, uh, Dr. Steve Smith. Uh, Dr. Smith is a professor of psychology at St. Mary's University. He has previously held the roles of Associate Vice President Academic and Enrollment Management. Dean of Science and Registrar, all at St. Mary's University. Steve has an extensive history of working in and developing effective partnerships internal to the university with provincial and national partners and with industry and government. Steve's tri-council provincial and industry funded research covers a broad range of topics, including forensic psychology, bias against people with criminal records, particularly Black and Indigenous applicants, student success, health promotion, EDIA issues, and others. Steve's research has been funded by SHRP, the Canadian Foundation for Innovation, CFI, uh, the New Frontiers in Research Fund, the Nova Scotia Health Research Foundation, MyTax, Research Nova Scotia, and a number of other public and private funding agencies. Steve has also served on and chaired numerous funding committees, provincially and nationally. Uh, so I welcome Dr. Stephen Smith, who is a colleague and a very good friend of mine. Very, very happy to have you join us today, Steve. Thanks I'll just do, uh, it's my pleasure, uh, just a quick little housekeeping for all of our participants today to ask that you turn off your cameras and mute yourself unless you're speaking or asking a question, just so that we can uh, protect some of our bandwidth and uh, not have to run into delays in, in the presentation. Uh, uh, Cynthia and I will monitor the chat for Steve. So Steve has said that you're welcome to ask questions. It's just that he won't be able to see them. So if you do have a question and you want to put it in the chat, we'll look at them there. Uh, otherwise, at the end of Steve's presentation, you are welcome to ask questions. So welcome. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you all for coming. Uh, very happy to be here. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk uh, a bit about, um, um, you know, what I know about grants. Um, and uh, so I want to spend a little time. I should say, I'll I'll talk about why. Uh, I was joking with Suzanne. The why me question. Um, and um, one of the things that I've been able to do over the years is. Um, get uh, research funding from a number of different organizations. And uh, uh, a lot of that is because my research is in psychology and I do a lot of uh, work around um, uh, forensic psychology, uh, persuasion, uh, that sort of thing. A lot of my research has been funded by SHRC, uh, but also because I do a lot of partnership work with a lot of different agencies um, I've gotten grant funding from all over the place. So those, what I'm trying to talk about today is a bit about what are sort of the, the typical things that we need to think about when we're uh, applying for grant funding. Um, and there's a lot of commonality across all the different kind of granting agencies that you can apply for. And I'm going to focus on that today. Uh, my expertise really is in SHRC. Um, you can see here I have uh, gotten significant research funding from SHRC. I've chaired a number of committees for SHRC. Um, I have um, uh, sat on many other committees at all levels. So for you know student funding, for new faculty funding, for established faculty funding, for you know things even funding for journals and that sort of thing. So 
lots of different um, programs that I've been involved with, with lots of different agencies. And really fundamentally, um, a lot of these agencies focus on um, the same kind of information that they want to see from applicants. Um, different, obviously different kinds of grants have different kinds of things you need to think about. Uh, for example, um, you know, partnership grants that involve, you know, uh, academics and, and non-academics, um, then there's different kinds of relationships they want to see and that sort of thing. Um, and so what I'm going to do today is try to run you through what are the things that are the, the common elements across uh, almost all of those uh, grant application processes. Um, and as Suzanne said, uh, I'm very happy to have uh, questions uh, during my presentation, or you can save them to the end. Um, and since I can't actually, you know, see anyone, uh, I'm going to just assume that you'll put it in the chat or put your hand up um, and, um, you know, ask the question and uh, perfectly happy to be interrupted whenever that works for you. Um, OK, so. Uh, what I'm going to again do is just really talk about some of the general issues around grant presentation. Um, and the most important step at the, is really understanding at the beginning, what are you trying to accomplish? OK, you don't want to submit a grant application that is, you know, what we'd consider premature. You don't want to submit something that is, oh, I'm going to submit this and, and see what people think and see what kind of feedback I get. You want to try to have as polished a product as possible. And the reason is for that, obviously, you, you want to put a good presentation in, you want to put a good grant application in. But fundamentally, granting agencies, particularly when you start to move away from agencies uh, like SHRC or the Tri-Council, or you start to move to agencies that um, you know, work a lot with uh, the general public or uh, public-private partnerships, they often have money that's been given to them to um, support these programs, and they're not often getting the quality of applications that they need. So there's a good chance that when you apply for these programs, as long as you have a reasonable quality application that you'll get funding. Um, my tax is a good example of that. Uh, my tax has certain amounts of money that they're allowed to, um, uh, my, I'm sorry, I should take a step back. What my tax funds typically are internships. These are paid positions that are funded through uh, corporations or um, non-government agencies, that sort of thing. Um, and that partner puts up half the money and then my tax will match that. And so in some regions, my tax has a hard time spending all of their money. So for example, with um, in Nova Scotia, um, this is very rare, but every single application that I put into my tax has been accepted. And if you know anything about grant writing, you know that most grants do not get accepted. So the fact that that those are getting accepted at such a high rate really reflect two things. One, that there has to be an investment from the partner to make that work, but two, also that they have money they need to give out. And so having a, you know, a, a, a well-written application is going to be, um, you know, uh, very handy when you know you to, to get that money. So when you're preparing a, a document, you want to make sure you don't submit anything that really isn't ready. Um, you want to make sure simple things uh, that there's no errors in spelling or grammar or, or fact. Um, you want your language to be clear and unambiguous. You want to avoid any jargon or any trendy terms. And importantly, redundancy is good. Now, you may be wondering, what do I mean by redundancy is good? Well, what that means is, is that um, when you're trying to explain the purpose of your research, you're trying to explain the methods of your research or justify your budget in particular, um, you want to repeat the same information multiple times. So you want to uh, make sure that your reader is going to understand the objective you're trying to achieve and going to understand how you're going to achieve that objective at multiple points in the grant. Now, obviously, some grant applications are very short, so it's hard to do that. But things like SHRP or other partnership grants can be very long. And so you have the opportunity with, with specific sections to justify things. So for example, if you were to write up um, in your, um, you know, um, research proposal section about what you were going to do and how you're going to collect data, 
um, there is where you start to justify the budget you're using. You're saying, oh, we're going to collect data in this way, which we know is going to cost this much. And so we know that we you know, are going to need to do this. And then you can repeat that information when you get to your budget section, right? So that allows for some additional um, you know, redundancy and clarity. Um, and importantly, it gets away from concerns around, oh, they didn't say this, or, you know, um, often um, when you get a review for a journal article or uh, a grant application, it'll say, oh, well, the authors really should have talked about this. And you'll look at that and you'll say, but I did talk about that. Um, and so if it's a very important point, repeating it allows the uh, reader to probably get that point at least at least once, if not more than once. Okay. One second. So, guys, uh, okay. In terms of overall presentation, um, you want to uh, make sure that you establish clearly the need for the research. Why is this important? What are you trying to accomplish? Why is this something that has not been done before? Okay. Why are, do you have the ability to do this specifically that other people may not have had the ability to do it before? You want to demonstrate that that research is important and your research is original. Okay, that's very important for most uh, grant application uh, processes is that you have to demonstrate that what you're going to do has some originality to it and is going to have an impact. Depending on the granting agency, depending on the program, how you define impact, uh, you know, can vary. So for SHRP Insight Grants, for example, or Insight Development Grants with sort of their core research uh, application processes, there what you're doing is demonstrating, you know, how this is going to provide new science, um, how it's going to provide new findings that are going to be useful. Um, in a partnership grant, you may not necessarily be as focused on uh, identifying what is the new uh, discovery that you're doing. It may be a lot more about building the partnership. So that can be a very important outcome. And again, remember, whatever you're doing, you want to state these very clear needs for the research and the importance of the research and the originality of the research at multiple points. So you'd want to start, for example, with some sort of summary. You'd say that this is the, you know, why it's important, why it's original. Then you go into your lit review or whatever else, repeat it in there, and then repeat it in some conclusionary point. Um, and in particular, in some grants too, uh, specific kinds of partnership grants, um, you're expected to talk about how you're going to do knowledge translation. You're expected to talk about how you're going to build partnerships or expand your partnerships. And so you want to you know, reiterate that at several points in the grant as well. All right. Um, any questions so far? Nope. Not at the moment. In the chat. Oh, uh, yeah, that uh, Suzanne posted the link to my text. OK. OK, great. Thank you. Um, OK, I will continue. Um, all right, so um, generally speaking, every granting agency will have its own way of doing the assessment process. With, and so, for example, again, I keep, keep talking to Shirk because that's my, my uh, greatest area of expertise. Shirk has multiple different programs, and depending on the program, you can have very different assessment processes. So, for example, uh, with the Insight Grants, what they do is they go and they seek out peer review, just like you would with any journal article. Um, they get two to three people to provide reviews of the grant, and then the committee members who have a variety of expertise will also review those grants. Um, and so what happens is, is the final assessment of the grant is based on the reviewers and the committee members. A lot of the smaller programs, uh, so the Insight Development Grants, for example, or the um, Engage Grants, uh, and really most grants that are being looked at by uh, private organizations are going to be reviewed by a committee and not by necessarily um, external assessors that are in your field. So you have to think about it as the people that are going to be reading your grant are going to be experts in their own field, but they're not necessarily an expert in your area. Um, ideally, when they when uh, granting agencies asked for external reviewers, 
those folks are experts in your field. Um, certainly Shirk tries their best to do that, but you can't assume that that is going to be the case. So really what you want to do is make sure when you do your writing, and I'll talk a bit about this again a little bit, um, that you want to do, uh, you know, make sure you're very clear. Again, don't use jargon. Don't use terms that people, the you know, think of it as a, uh, a smart, uh, you know, first year university student would understand. Um, and you want to try to strike a balance in what you're doing between the ambition of the project in terms of what are you really trying to accomplish and how re what you can realistically accomplish in the, the term of the grant. And again, redundancy is good. What I mean by that is what you want to do is you want to be clear that um, often the bigger picture that you're trying to address is not going to be addressable in the term of the grant. But what you can do is talk about the big picture and then talk about what are the pieces of that big picture that your grant is going to accomplish. In other words, you know, you could say this is a this is the overall big problem. I'm going to take this slice of the problem, but this is how I'm going to address everything I need to address in this. Slice. And again, you can talk about that at various points in the grant application. You can again repeat the key elements of what you're trying to accomplish and how you're going to do it. Um, and importantly, particularly in uh, some of the, you know, um, well, really in most grant applications, you want to demonstrate how this re research that you're doing builds on your past expertise and your accomplishments. So if you're a new uh, researcher just starting out, it can be hard to do that, right? Because you can say, well, you know, I don't have a whole lot of research experience necessarily. Um, but what you inevitably have is some component of your skill set that you can say, this is what brings me to this place. This is what allows me to be able to do this research now and maybe bring someone else on that can help with that. So a lot of uh, applicants for grants, you know, who are, are more junior will have as a collaborator or a co-applicant, someone who is more senior who has that skill set. And that shows to the committee that you're looking at how to, you know, maximize the likelihood that what you're doing is going to be successful, right? All right. Uh, next is some things to consider when you're going through your application. There's a lot of different components to a typical application. I'm going to run through what are the, the typical things you're going to have to do in every single grant application. There are certain kinds of components that are that are, you know, you get asked to provide pretty much no matter what kind of grant application you're doing. Um, sometimes you have. 10 pages uh, to do this in each section, and sometimes you have one. So um, the amount of a detail you're going to be able to put into any particular section that I'm going to talk about will vary depending on the grant application, but obviously typically you have generally a somewhat longer piece that is about talking about what the research is and what you're doing, a somewhat shorter piece around um, budget, and then another piece around who you are as an individual. Um, why are you the right person to do this work? So um, I also want to touch on actually, one of the things that it, that is, um, happens all the time with grant applications is you get turned down. Um, but a lot of granting agencies give you an opportunity to revise things so um, and submit again the next year. So Shirk does this, for example, and they have for if you are doing a revision, you have one page to summarize the changes you've made since the previous application. Uh, gives you the opportunity to justify changes made to the project following critiques from the committee or from the reviewers or from whoever else, or even just talk a bit about how you have changed as a researcher over that year. If there is, a, if you are revising an application, if you're resubmitting an application, um, absolutely do this. This is always option optional when it is there, um, and it's important to do it because it shows the committee who may be a completely different group of people that you have listened to and thought carefully about what's been given to you as feedback. And if nothing else, what that does is it provides you an opportunity to demonstrate to the committee and to demonstrate to any reviewers that you listened and you adjusted and you changed and that you were 
really help, thankful for the feedback that you've gotten, which is always a good thing to um, communicate to the committee. Uh, I had, uh, uh, I'll talk about that a little later, but I have some seen some very amusing decisions that people have made when revising and resubmitting grants, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Most uh, grants uh, ask for a summary of the proposal, somewhere between half a page and a page. Uh, it must be clear. They often these are asked, they ask you to use plain language so that they can publish that, put it on their website or whatever else. Um, and so you want to make sure that whatever you write there is very, very clear, states very simply, this is what we're doing. This is why it's important. This is how we're going to accomplish it. Again, again, this is why this is important and this is what we're going to do. So again, a little bit of redundancy. Um, most uh, grants uh, require a uh, detailed description. Um, that can be, depending on the grant, anywhere from two pages to six pages, a double spaced or single spaced. But what's important there is you want to make sure that you're being very clear uh, in terms of what the specific objectives are of the grant, why you're conducting the work, why it's important, um, and uh, you write the project in a way that is clear enough for the experts that you know what you're doing, but also written in a way that a generalist uh, understands um, what you're talking about. So it's very important, for example, to properly define acronyms. I personally advise every any time I do grant reviews, which I do all the time now, I always say don't use acronyms. Acronyms get very confusing very quickly if you are a person who is reviewing 20 or 30 grant applications. You don't know what things mean after the first time you've read the, the acronym. And so you keep having to go back and it's very irritating. And what that does is, is it creates this um, bias in the reviewer that you're not writing clearly because they'll say, oh, I don't know what this means. And that's as much about them as it is about you, of course, but you wanna make sure that you do everything you possibly can uh, to minimize the frustrations that a reviewer might experience when reading your grant. It goes back to what I said at the beginning. You know, no typos, no spelling mistakes, no jargon. Um, use clear and simple language, use spacing. We'll talk a bit about that a little later too. So um, you wanna make sure uh, that the project, that your uh, literature review is up to date uh, and is very clearly linked to what you're trying to do. Um, I have seen many, many times people spend a lot of time on the theoretical justification or the conceptual framework that they're putting in and then spend very little time on what they're actually doing. You're much better off, um, you know, this isn't, a, you're not writing a white paper, you're, you're writing a justification. You should think of the introduction component in a lit review as a justification for the research that you're doing and a justification for why it's important. And then spend the vast majority of time talking about what other methodology you're going to be using to accomplish your goal. And the reason is, is because Typically, grants fail for a number of different reasons. They almost never fail because of the theoretical framework. They almost always fail because of budget issues or because people don't understand what you're doing. So the more time and the more clarity you put into the methodology and the objectives, the better off you're going to be. Okay. Right. So. Um, in terms of the methodology, explain and justify your choice of methodology. Uh, if you're using a particular thematic approach to how you're using your methods, uh, then you want to justify that. Some grants now are asking for things around positionality, uh, which I have a problem with for uh, a variety of reasons, which I won't get into. Uh, I don't think you should have to justify positionality um because I anyway, know I will briefly say the challenge I see with positionality is it revolves around values um and values shouldn't be involved in research um at least that's what I've always been taught uh so uh but some grants will ask for positionality statements um happy to go into what those are if you don't know what I mean by that um and there should be a very clear match between uh what you're doing in terms of the objectives and the methodology you've chosen so if you're trying to accomplish whatever particular goals you are trying to accomplish it should be clear why uh you've chosen the particular methods that you have like how will those methods achieve that how will your analyses achieve that 
um, and that should be very, very clear. Um, some of the kind, some of the things we see uh, in in grant applications that don't succeed um, is too many studies. So I say here six well described studies are more convincing than 12 poorly described studies. Uh, that's absolutely true. Um, obviously, you're not going to be proposing six studies if you are doing a one year grant. Um, you know, you probably want to be you have to be very realistic about what you're going to be able to accomplish in a given time frame, usually a year or more. Um, and you have to be because and in particular, um, if you have studies that are going to take more than one year to do. So a lot of uh, a lot of people do research that is longitudinal. Um, so you're doing research over multiple years and that can take a lot of time. You want to be realistic for what you're proposing based on your stage of career and your team. Um, more senior people with more research experience can can propose with more access to students, um, can propose more complex projects in a very realistic way. Uh, and again, this is all very tightly related to um, how you um, uh, how you justify your ability to actually conduct the work. So if you have been able to do this kind of work before, it's very easy and you should point back to your previous successes as justification for your ability to do the work. You can say, hey, this is the same approach we used in this study, and this is how long it took us to collect that data, and this is how much money it cost to do that, um, that sort of thing. That's very uh, powerful justification for, for what you're doing. Um, similarly, if you haven't done that kind of work before, make sure you've talked to someone who has so that you can talk about it in a way that is, you know, uh, your ability to uh, effectively and intelligently describe what you're doing and, and accomplish your goals. All right, knowledge mobilization and translation. This is something that is very, very common now uh, in, in grant applications. Um, and fundamentally, uh, I think this it should be a, a primary component of, of all grant applications. And this is about what are you going to do once you get the results from your work? Um, who are you going to communicate those results to? Uh, you want to be creative uh, and ambitious, but also provide justification. Um, so I worked, uh, I've worked closely, I've had the good fortune to work closely with someone at Mount St. Vincent University who is excellent at knowledge translation. She's taught me so much about how to do this effectively. Um, and as an academic, I was always trained that what you want to do is, uh, you know, peer reviewed journal articles because that's, that's the, that's the, you know, gold standard of, you know, that's the most important thing, but it's really only one thing, right? Obviously there is communication, uh, to the public. Uh, if you're doing partnership grants, there's going to be communication to the stakeholders. Um, there's going to be communication to the broader audience. Uh, I don't know if you, any of you have heard about an um, uh, um, online magazine that's called The Conversation. Uh, there's a, it's, it's a fantastic outlet for academic research uh, and how it applies to the real world. So we put a couple articles in there and, and that's just been fantastic. Um, you know, we're getting tens of thousands of people reading about our research that way. It's just it's excellent. Uh, again, happy to talk about that some more. Um, and it's important that there be a plan for not only that you're going to communicate to people outside of academia, but how are you going to do it? How are you going to reach the professionals as well if you're doing something that is about uh, programmatic? Um, so how are you going to reach the professionals that do those kinds of programs? Because you want to do that as much as possible as well. Hey. Um, team members and student training. Uh, this is two kinds of things that often roll together. Um, so the first is really talking about um, how can the team that you've put together. Oh, I see a hand. Yes, uh, Jocelyn, uh, Joyce Thompson had put in the chat. If your proposal would encompass multiple studies over a period of time, but you are applying for a limited term, e.g. one year grant to complete one part of this, to what extent would you describe and define the anticipated future studies? Or would it be better to describe the one current study and would uh, that would be accomplished through this current grant? Great question, Joyce. Uh, what I would suggest is what you do is you talk about the general problem, like the problem that um, the whole set of studies would aim to address, 
Uh, you talk about that in the introduction, you talk a bit about that at the conclusion, and then you can say the purpose of this grant is to conduct the initial work to address this, and this is going to involve this subset of studies. And then you talk about um, within the context of the grant application, you put as much effort as possible in describing the methodology for those particular studies that you're going to do. And then at the end of the, you know, uh, detailed description, you say, you know, assuming these, you know, goals are accomplished, we're going to be able to, in, you know, future research, do X, Y, and Z. And that then addresses this bigger problem. And so you talk about that research as the necessary first steps in answering the bigger picture question. Um, and then you, and, and that, well, it does two things. One, it allows the reviewer to understand you have a bigger picture perspective on things. But what it also does is it, it says, okay, it allows them to recognize that you know that there are limits to what you can do with the grant funding you're applying for. That makes sense? Perfect. All right. Yes. It's funny because Joyce, your picture is right here. So I'm looking at your picture as I'm speaking and then it's like, well, yeah, but she can't nod in that picture. Um, okay. Well, I could try. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. All right. Uh, OK, so uh, team members and student training. Um, and again, please say something because I have another screen open, so I can't always see when the hands go up. Uh, so uh, if you have a, a, a comment, please, please say that. Um, and um, just interrupt me. Uh, so uh, it's very important for the team members and student training. Sometimes these are like I was saying, sometimes these are separate. Sometimes they are together. Um, a lot of grants, SHRC in particular, have an expectation that student mentoring and student training is going to be a fundamental component. Uh, I know it's certainly my bias, and it's been the bias of almost all the SHRC committees that I've been on, that we far, we very much prefer to see money go to students than to uh, professional uh, staff, like professional researchers, I mean. Um, and uh, so that is because, um, you know, part of the goal of most research funding is to train the next generation of researchers. And so they want to see that you're employing students uh, to do that work and getting them involved in that work. Um, my strategy as an academic has always been to get my students involved in research early, uh, not just honor students or masters or PhD students, but getting them involved as you know more junior undergrads, get them involved in the research, get them, you know, taking part in things, and then you can demonstrate that you have a clear established history of doing this. And we'll talk a bit more about this when we talk about the CV component. Um, but what you want to do is demonstrate the need for the team. Like, why do you have the expertise that you do in the particular project you're proposing? And why do you need the students or the other you know, research staff that you do in order to get the research done? You want to be very clear about each person's role and justify their inclusion in the project. Uh, make sure you talk about the time allocation and that sort of thing and establish clear roles and appropriate tasks for the students. And I said before that often if you're a junior researcher and you know you're relatively new, you want to bring a more senior person on to provide some additional justification, not justification, that's really not the right term, but um, you know, proof that you are going to be able to conduct that research. But what we also see very commonly is that um, people put on a, uh, uh, a grant application, someone who is actually very senior and you know a super researcher and that sort of thing, but um, they are also, it's not clear why they're there other than to strengthen the application. And that typically will you know irritate the committee members because they're like, I don't understand why this person's here other than to make the grant look better. They don't seem to actually have a role. They don't seem to have any kind of commitment to a particular element of the project. So you want to make sure wherever possible that you go and do as much detail as possible with that. OK, and remember. Um, annoying reviewers and committees is bad. <laughs> this may seem obvious, but Again, as a persuasion researcher, um, one of the things you know that it's very important to uh, you know communicate from my perspective is that the way you present your work is going to create a bias for how someone reads your work, right? If your work is well written, if your work is well presented, if you're not using acronyms that are confusing, 
there will be an automatic positive bias towards um, your work. If you're doing things that annoy someone who's reading it, they're going to get frustrated with what you're they're reading, and their people are not very good at just understanding what it is that they don't like. Do they not like your writing style, or do they not like the research that you're doing? So it's important as much as possible to not do things that are going to irritate uh, a committee member uh, or a reviewer. So for example, um, what you want to do is, uh, hold on a second, is it coming in the chat? No. Um, what you want to do is make sure you use paragraph breaks. Surprisingly, this is one of the challenges that people seem to have is, is that, you know, they are so, sp space is always limited in grants, always. Um, and using space effectively is, uh, is very important in terms of how people interpret, ironically, how you're going to be able to do the work in the sense that if you can't manage the space that you have, then you're going to have, you know, the, the, they'll be like, well, how are you going to manage the, the work that you're doing? I know it sounds a bit odd that way, but it's, it's again, one of these things that just create bias. So you don't want to use super small fonts. You want to use the fonts that they tell you to use. You don't want to break any rules. That's something that irritates people a lot. Um, you don't want to scrunch margins or line spacing so that you get more space. Uh, you do want to use headings. Uh, because it makes things easier to read. Uh, it makes it clear what the next point is you're trying to make and that sort of thing. Um, don't complain about how little space you have, uh, you know, which is surprisingly common in grant applications. Like, oh, I'd have, have said more, but I don't have the space. It's like, well, no, then just say what you, you know, can in the space that's good. But again, redundancy is good. Make sure you repeat yourself as much as possible so that your key points are getting out there, uh, you know, uh, over and over and over again. All right. Oops. Um, more things that annoy reviewer. Uh, saying that there's no work on your topic when there is. Uh, if you're not sure, double check, ask someone else. It is very rare in our world that there is any topic that has not got some research on it. That research may not be very extensive. It may not be very good. It may be very old. It may use a, an outdated technique or approach. That's all fair, but there's probably some work out there about what, on the topic that you want to look at. So you need to understand what it is and what the problem with it is with it and explain that effectively so that you can further justify what you're doing. Don't critique the committee or reviewers from the previous year. Um, so uh, I said I would come back to this story. Um, I once uh, I was sitting on a shirk insight grant committee um, and I was uh, chairing the committee. I think no, I was a reviewer. I was a reviewer and then the following year I was chair uh, and I was the reviewer on the committee and this person had put in a grant and they were an extremely well established researcher uh, who is, you know, very close to retirement. So had 30 years of experience had all kinds of students, submitted a grant, very clearly hadn't put any effort into it, and was banking on the fact that I am well known in this field, I am incredibly successful, you should just give me my money and trust me. And I found that annoying uh, because it was in my area and um, you know, I, I, was, I was frustrated that they had not explained the research very well and the person didn't get the grant. I was not the only person making that decision to be clear. Um, but what happened was, is the next year I was on the committee again, as were several of the people that made the same, that made that decision about that grant not getting funded. And the person chose to provide a uh, response to reviewers and basically talked about how the committee clearly didn't understand how brilliant he was. And the committee from last year were all a bunch of morons and therefore their decision should just be ignored and we should just give him the money and trust him. That did not go over well. Um, and I know it may seem obvious not to do something like that, but critiquing people who critique you is, is very common. Um, and so my perspective is always on, uh, I will never, for example, point out an error from a reviewer. So if a reviewer says something like, oh, you should really include the standard deviations for this particular analysis, and they were in the paper to begin with, I'll say, thank you so much for that feedback. These standard deviations are now included on page whatever, 
right? Um, and I and I do that a lot. And I always start with, thank you very much for all the feedback and end with, we really feel this is a stronger application, yada, yada, yada. And importantly, I think a lot of people tend to focus only on the negative feedback they got. Uh, and so you actually want to focus on the positive feedback as well, because you want to reiterate all the positive things about that the reviewer said about your application. Um, and then show not only that you listened, but how you addressed each of the criticisms. Um, and that makes a very successful you know, uh, response document. All right. Um, what you also don't want to do is have a team of researchers propose the same successful grant from the previous year or other granting agency, but with a different order of authors. This is also very common, particularly with large teams um, where they may just take, you know, essentially, uh, particularly in psychology, there's a lot of overlap between um, the tri councils, for example, between SHRC and NSERC and CIHR. Um, depending on how you frame a particular grant, it can be very health focused or very social science focused or very, you know, natural science focused. And so what you'll sometimes see is um, so they'll submit a grant that seems reasonable, but then when you look at their past grant history, like, well, you have basically the same grant that you got funded from SHRC or from NSERC or CIHR last year. So what, how is this different? And some of the granting agencies have picked up on that. So they will require a section on how this relates to or is um, different from uh, previous grants. So you want to make sure that you what you're proposing is unique and you can demonstrably, uh, you know, uh, indicate how it is unique. Um, again, and I mentioned this earlier, you don't want to include a prominent researcher with no clear role in the project because that just, um, you know, confuses uh, everyone. OK, presenting your CV. Every single granting agency will require that you do some kind of CV. Um, I, I take that back. I have we have applied for a couple simple ones that where they don't. Um, but what you want to do is make sure that you present your 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 history and the history of any co-applicants very, very clearly uh, and really focus on um, how your background is going to make you able to be successful for this particular grant application. So, for example, um, follow the instructions very carefully. Um, usually, uh, granting agencies will have certain expectations for how you list uh, work experience and research experience and uh, previous grants, um, your publications and everything else. So you'll want to make sure you follow those uh, requirements very, very carefully. Uh, you want to provide complete citations of your published work and you want to organize your CV in a clear and logical manner. And you don't want to overinflate your, your CV uh, as well. Like you don't want to, you know, have uh, give reviewers any sense that you may be um, not lying, but certainly exaggerating your successes. You want to demonstrate um, forcefully uh, that your productivity from previous grants um, is, is important and relevant, uh, particularly if you're required to talk about most significant work, which is uh, typical in, in things like tri-council agencies. Um, you want to talk about the relative importance of the scholarly journal or other input. Don't assume that the people reading it know uh, if the journal you've published in is good or not, if it's the top journal in the field or the number two journal in the field, you want to put that in there so that they know that. Um, and, you know, indicate if you have it, uh, any reviews or any citations that you may have had of the work. Okay. Um, some things that annoy committee members and reviewers, uh, not organizing your publications, um, things like, you know, putting presentations uh, in the same grouping as uh, peer reviewed publications, uh, putting submitted or non refereed papers in within press and in print refereed works. Um, saying a journal is a top journal when it's not, um, not being clear on the outlet for the work or whether it's peer reviewed or not, you know, the, almost every single granting agency will want to know if something has been peer reviewed or, or not, and will want to know what is a regular presentation versus a peer reviewed presentation versus a, an invited presentation. Um, you want to make sure you're using a fairly standard uh, reference format. Um, you don't want to say things like, you know, hoping the committee realizes how outstanding you are relative to your peers. I mentioned that with that one particular faculty member, but this is actually way more common uh, than you might think. Uh, the more humble amongst you may be surprised. 
Um, oh, Cynthia, did you put your hand up again? Or is that from before? Yes, quick question for you. So yeah. what if you're just starting out in the field? How do you sell yourself in your CV if you don't really have any publications yet? Well, what you want to talk about there then is, is, is if you don't have publications, you want to talk about your research work. Uh, what research work have you done? Uh, what have you been successful at? What projects have you been involved in? Um, you know, think of it as research adjacent uh, uh, or publication adjacent work. Um, how are you communicating with the public? How are you communicating with your peers? All that sort of stuff. Um, so there's a lot of things that you can talk about that you've done, um, you know, that would not necessarily be related to a publication. Uh, a lot of people like I, for example, have a whole section in my CV on reports. So these are reports that I've written that are academic in nature, but aren't necessarily published anywhere. Right. Um, and so that's the kind of work that might be related that could be particularly useful for you. Uh, and a lot of us have to do those kinds of reports, um, you know, within our work and, and that sort of thing. So you can definitely do things like that. You want to talk about your presentations, um, talk about your theses, uh, you know, um, honors theses, master's theses, PhDs, whatever. Uh, all of those things are important components. You probably would have work that's in preparation for publication. So you want to have an, a section about being have things that are in prep um, and how they relate and that sort of thing, or at least how that relates to your ability to do research. So um, and again, if you really have no publications, it you know, uh, it really depends on the type of grant, right? So for example, a lot of the partnership grants, it's not really about your publications. It's about what's your skill at developing partnerships and working with, you know, uh, public and private agencies or nonprofits. Um, so you can craft your CV in a way that really focuses on your skills related to what you're trying to accomplish with that grant. Make sense? Yes, very All much. Right. All right. Uh, I'm going to run through budget stuff a little quickly just because um, I know that we, uh, um, I'm realizing I, I I always do this. I talk too long. I don't mind staying after three, but I'm sure many of you will have to go. Um, so um, principles in terms of budget, you want to follow a principle of minimal essential funding. What is the absolute? You know, you want to justify pretty much every penny that you uh, ask for. Um, you want to justify all of your proposed expenses and make sure those expenses are reasonable. Um, you want to relate that clearly to uh, the work that you're doing. So why do you have to spend this much money to do this kind of uh, methodology? Um, you want to make sure you include any other sources of funding. This is actually something that uh, a lot of grants are looking for now. They want to see what kind of in-kind and cash contributions you're getting from other groups. Um, so, and every university is different, but so for example, at St. Mary's, um, we can count graduate student funding as uh, cash contributions. We can count um, access to various software programs as an in-kind contribution. Uh, they don't, they won't allow things like your office space typically, but um, if there is something that's being given so that you can do uh, conferences, like they're going to give you conference space for free, that can be an in-kind contribution or, you know, um, catering or whatever else. Uh, those are all things that you can include in the grant application. And again, um, you should definitely check with your research, assuming you have a research services officer, um, you want to check with them about what are the typical kinds of things that go into those grants. And this is often more important with the partnership grants because they'll want to see what the people you're partnering with are contributing as well. And that's usually their staff time and their office space and that sort of thing, which is eligible. Um, your own is not typically. Um, Okay, so expenses must conform to the rates and regulations in effect at your institution. Uh, typically, uh, sometimes with certain grants, if they're government grants, they'll say you have to use the government stuff, but typically they say no, this is based on what your institutional standard is. Um, if you do uh, a really overestimated budget, some granting agencies will penalize you for that. So Shirk, if you can, they determine that you can do the grant for uh, 60, 60, maybe it's 50% or less than what you ask for, they automatically fail you. And they do, I know, because I've been on both sides of that. I've had a grant fail because I asked for too much money, and I've been on the committees when we failed people for asking for ridiculous amounts of money. So you want to make sure that everything you say is, is very justified. Um, and you want to estimate your costs as accurately as possible. Using round numbers typically is not something people want to see. 
All right, things that annoy committees uh, in budgets, um, using non-student personnel without justification for certain grants in particular, I mentioned that earlier, asking for four research assistants when you only need one, asking you know ridiculous amounts of money uh, for something that's relatively simple, um, asking for things that aren't allowed. Uh, normally your research grants officer will um, catch those things for you. Um, and be careful about asking for travel money. So uh, a lot of places, um, you know, SHRT, for example, doesn't give you travel money in the first year of a grant because they're, they argue, unless it's for the, to do the research itself, but they don't give you money for travel for conferences and that sort of thing because they say, well, you're probably not going to get that done in a year. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So we only give grant money starting in the second year. Um, evaluation. Uh, as I kind of alluded to, uh, you're evaluated as a researcher, your team is evaluated, and the project is evaluated. Um, and uh, the kinds of things you're evaluated on are, um, the, you know, you and your team are evaluated on the quality and, and significance of your work, um, the originality of previous research and its impact on the discipline, quality of the research, importance of other scholarly activities, how recent your output is, um, again, what's quality of the team, and contribution again we're applicable with certain grant applications uh, what the contribution is to training of future researchers so uh those are important components in terms of you and your team and again um, i'm going to make these slides available so uh if anyone wants to see anything uh they certainly can um you're also going to be uh in terms of the project be evaluated on the theoretical perspectives the appropriateness of the strategy suitability of plans to communicate so all those things that we talked about earlier originality and expected um, scholarly impact. And then I am going to have one slide I want to cover quickly and then it will turn to questions. Um, and again, redundancy is good. Surprise. Um, see you, Joyce. Um, and failure is normal. Uh, you shouldn't be afraid of failure um, because, you know, we always Failure happens all the time with grant applications. Uh, you know, some of the granting agencies I've applied for the success rates in the you know teens. Uh, so applying multiple times is normal. But again, you want to make sure you learn from those applications. Uh, if you resubmit, try to make improvements, incorporate any feedback, um, try to do a revive a response to previous comments page. And again, like I said, be humble and appreciative of all their feedback, even if they're dumb. So uh, just trust that, um, you know, if you can make the demonstrate that you're improving, you're going to be able to uh, improve your chances of getting that grant. So I will stop there with seven whole minutes uh, uh, left uh, in the time. And again, I don't mind sticking around a little longer if that uh, works for folks. But uh, yeah, I will say any questions. That was great, Steve. Hopefully many uh, so questions. <laughs> I'll just uh, I'll wait if others have a question because I have one. I'm going to ask while others perhaps are typing or thinking, but um, uh, you mentioned how uh, if this is your first time writing a grant to reflect on all of the other scholarly research or input that you've done, which may not have led to a publication, but how important that is to include. Um, and I think uh, that perhaps for if there are li librarians uh, who are present in this uh, presentation, uh, some some of us can uh, go through our graduate program without having uh, done a thesis. So uh, in some instances, there there is no publication that's happened prior. So um, I just wonder if you could give some tips on things that we could include, like working on a research team, yeah. uh, uh, you know, white papers. We write a lot of white papers as librarians, um, things like that. Yeah, so that's sort of, if you go back to us talking about, you know, reports and, and doing, you know, talking about reports you've done, very similar with white papers, right? Same kind of idea is that you've done a comprehensive uh, program of research on something and you've provided details on that and presumably recommendations and conclusions and that sort of thing. I mean, that's research, right? So it's not a peer reviewed publication, but it is uh, important to demonstrate your skills and demonstrates that, you know, and particularly if it's relevant to the project you're proposing, you want to be able to um, identify those things. And presumably with any of those, you're going to have done presentations on it, either at a conference or internally. 
you want to include those things too. And it's just a matter of being clear on what those are and being honest about what those are so that you're not trying to overinflate your your CV um, inappropriately. But yeah, there's yeah. so many different things you can talk about. Um, even having done specific kinds of relevant research papers as a student, even if it's not a thesis, um, you know, there's the opportunity to include that kind of content as well. Yeah, I think those are really good points. I know for myself that b before I actually uh, uh, was successful in a grant application, most of my scholarly contributions were done through conference uh, presentations, which essentially you do all the research, just not publishing it. You're presenting it to your peers. Um, yeah. So well, I just and, and that's what happens, right? Is is you know that's the typical you know if you if, um, you know you have more of a structured day to day job is that you don't have the offer, you don't have protected writing time. And so yeah. what happens is you can get things to a point where you can put it into a conference presentation or, or an invited presentation and do that. But what you don't have is the time to then reconceptualize that and put that into a peer reviewed paper and go through that whole process, right? Which is very unfortunate. And I think that's a problem with our, our system is that we do not, um, you know, give very good opportunities for professional development for librarians. Um, yeah. So I will say, and Suzanne knows this, but I was president of the faculty union at SMU, so librarians are within our faculty union. So I, we had a lot of discussions about the particular challenges librarians experience. So. Yeah, and I think uh, Cynthia makes a good point, which is that as librarians, uh, a lot of what we do is practical. Uh, so not necessarily we help other students and faculty with their research, but a lot of what we do as professionals is practical. Yeah. So, um, but that's a strength, yeah. right? So yep, that's a definitely. strength, particularly oh. if you're if you're going to talk about um, grants where you're looking to build partnerships with, uh, you know, other agencies, partnerships with other libraries, partnerships yeah. with public libraries, those sorts of things, because that's exactly what you do. Right. And so it's just a matter of, of talking about that in an effective way. And so even if you can't talk about a particular output that you've done what you can do is talk about the projects that you've worked on and the partnerships that you've built so that you can you know justify this is why i'm able to do this this is why i'm going to be able to make this project happen um, and again if there's a particular methodology that you need to do a particular project and you don't have experience in it or you can't necessarily um you know uh demonstrate that you're able to do it find someone who you can bring on who can and, and you know, you know, have a team member that is going to you you know has been able to do this previously. People love being partnership partners on grants, right? So yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. don't feel that you need to do it all on your own. Um, in fact, I would say of the grant applications I have done, maybe ten percent I'm the sole applicant. Almost always there are co-applicants. Even if I take the lead on it, there are co-applicants. There are many, many projects where I'm a co-applicant, um, you know, a co-investigator, where someone else is taking the lead, right? And that's yeah. that's part of building those partnerships. It's part of building your ability to get grants. Is you know, the, the best predictor of getting grants is having gotten grants. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the more grants you apply for, the more grants you will get, the more grants you will get in the future. Awesome. Uh, I think that's great, Steve. It's 2.59. Uh, I see Cynthia has her hand up, so I'll let her go, and then we'll see. Cynthia's the, the gatekeeper, so. Yeah. And I just suddenly totally forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> well, just send me an email. <laughs> so and, I think, uh, I, I, yeah, I think if anybody does have questions, because sometimes what happens is you think of the questions later. Um, uh, we can gather those, you can put them here in the chat and uh, we can share those with Steve and Steve will be yeah. able to to get back to everyone with Absolutely. those Absolutely, and answers. I will send Cynthia a um, PDF version of the slides uh, so that you can send that around for folks. Awesome. And, and I always make this offer at the end of my sessions where if there's any grant that you're applying for and you want some feedback on it, I'm happy to do that. Obviously, I'm not an expert expert in, in, in library sciences, but I'm happy to provide uh, my expertise around, uh, you know, good grant application, so. That's wonderful, Steve. Thank you. Cynthia, do you want to add anything? Uh, wonderful. This has been fantastic because uh, there's, uh, I may be further along in my career, but as, as Suzanne said, a lot of of what we do is practical. So how do you trans translating that, the tips for translating it into a, a grant application is very helpful. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Great. 
This has been wonderful, right, well, Steve. Thank, thank you, you so Take much. Care, folks. You're very Thank welcome. you. Thank See you. you. Later.